Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being here today. Today, we have someone who has worked on so many amazing records on this podcast. Chris Shaw is our guest, and he has literally worked with a humongous roster of bands, including Public Enemy, A Tribe Called Quest, Run DMC, Weezer, Bob Dylan, Jeff Buckley, Sheryl Crow, Death Cab for Cutie, Cheap Trick, The list just goes on and on and on. He has worked on six of Rolling Stone's top 500 greatest records of all time. There is a magic to the projects that he works on. And inside of this interview, I think you're going to get so many great takeaways. The way he just approaches music and listens to it and all of the little tips that he shares inside of this episode, I think are going to give you a new appreciation for working efficiently in the studio and paying attention to the little details of a record that can make or break it. So there is just so much amazing stuff in this episode. I'm going to stop rambling. Let's just jump right into the interview. Chris Shaw, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. No problem. For people who might not know your background and who might not be familiar with who you are, what you do, can you give us a little bit of that story? Uh, Sure. Um, I'm originally from New York. I'm living in Texas right now, just outside of Austin. But I started out um, working in studios my last year in college. I went to NYU. I went to their recording program there. And then um, my last year of... uh, NYU, I took an internship at this studio called Green Street Recording, um, which was a really big hip hop uh, studio at the time, hip hop and dance music, which were completely the opposite of what of the kind of music I like to listen to. I was pretty much your prog rock, punk, electronic uh, music kind of guy. And, um, but I had to take the internship, otherwise I wasn't going to graduate, and the studio was really close by to the um, school. So I, I just took it anyway. And, um, Shortly after I started working there, a couple things happened. Uh, they built a, a brand new B room in the back, so I helped them wire that up, and you know I learned you know a little bit of con- construction, and um, and I also wound up working. Um, the, shortly after I started there, Public Enemy started working there. This, you know, like one of the more bigger hip hop artists back then, and uh, I felt from working with them and the way they took sampling and um, to a whole nother level that I hadn't been taken before, I fell in love with the medium. I may not have been listening to the to the message, but I fell in love with the medium and the methods, as it were. Um, so I worked there for about five years, and then after I got to a certain point where I was engineering all these hip hop records, but I wanted to be a producer. And being like this white kid from Westchester, New York, I couldn't really, you know, pretend to be a hip hop producer, which is a completely different skill set than being a, a rock and roll producer or engineer. Um, and this was like in the early '90s, and I was actually able to go independent and start working on rock records because a lot of rock bands want to incorporate sampling and loops into their music, and. Before I knew it, I, I caught a couple of really great breaks. Um, my first really big break was I, I did a record for this band called Soul Asylum, uh, called Grave Dances Union. It had this really big hit song on it called Runaway Train. And uh, Michael Beinhorn hired me for that. And he hired me specifically because I would worked at Public Enemy. Um, um, because he knew it, but I, wasn't, I, I didn't have any rule. I, 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 it'd be easy for me to break rule, recording rules. So if he asked me to do something really extreme, I wouldn't you know, um, object to it at all like other engineers would. And um, and that just sort of uh, sort of snowballed after that. You know, a couple of years after that, I uh, I mixed a record for uh, Rick Ocasek, the, the leader and songwriter for the Cars. And a couple few months after I finished that record, he got the call to produce the first Weezer record. So I wound up doing the Blue album. And that was a really big hit. And from that point on, everything just you know kind of solidified my. Um, my spot, as it were, and I started getting work, uh, lots and lots of it. Um, and I just wound up being doing a lot of alternative records. Uh, I worked with the Bad Brains, worked with Weezer, Ween, Wilco, um, Modest Mouse, uh, Cheryl Crow. Um, and of course, my, my biggest client right now is I've been working with on and off for the last 20 years is Bob Dylan. And his last record, uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways, came out last year. Uh, that was the last thing I did with him. Well, actually, no, it's not. There's a, a new box set that just came out called um, Springtime in New York, and it's a collection of uh, outtakes from his 80s period. And I mixed that, finished that um, about three or four months ago. 
And uh, that's kind of it. Um, and then like the other things I have to dimension too is I started out as an analog guy. I mean, console, tape machines, um, obviously worked my way through samplers and drum machines and stuff like that. And uh, I was one of the first guys in New York to, you know, invest in a Pro Tools rig. You know, so I had like this really small 16 channel rig on an old, you know, Power Mac 9600 with the old 888 interfaces and stuff like that. And um, so I dove headfirst into that. But primarily I used it as, a, as another tape machine. But about four or five years after I started carting my rig around, every studio in New York and around the world had basically had it. So I kind of dove into the Pro Tools world pretty quickly. And then about, I would say about 10 years ago, with rare exception, everything I do now, I, I mix almost entirely into box. You know, uh, I, I didn't want I didn't want to have my own studio. I didn't want to be mixing stuff in the box from home because I really love working on a console. But you know, the way economics run and to be nimble and quick and to be able to take on as much work as possible, mixing in a box is the way to go. And the last, I'd say, five or six years, especially with the newer versions of Pro Tools, it's become a very feasible thing. And, this, and sonically, it's just you know almost indistinguishable from working on a console. I mean. Yes, yes and no, <laughs> you know, but it's, 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 it's this way. It's more than good enough to make great records, you know, mixing in a box. Let's, let's put it that way, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Well, there's there's a lot to unpack from your story there. And, and one of the things that right away, I think one of the first things you mentioned was that when you first started with this, you were wanting to be the rock guy and work with rock bands and all that. And then you, you just got in, thrown into this hip hop world, like completely different world. Yeah. And, and, and I'm curious to know, like, you know, what was what was that attitude for you of like going into this? Because because like I know some people are just like, I am only going to work on the things I like to work on. But I but I feel like in your case, it actually was beneficial in the long well, in the big picture yeah. to, to do that kind of thing. It's it's kind of strange because um, well, it's not strange at all. It, it, at, at, when you look at it, the music I would listen to <clears throat> before I started working on, on hip hop records, it, you may think they were very black and white worlds, but they're not really. When I was, you know, going to NYU, I started in 1983. That was the year MIDI was introduced. That's, that's how old I am, okay? Um, and, I, and I was very much into programming and synthesizers. You know, I was really into New Order and, you know, um, bands of that ilk. And um, so the way I approached hip-hop initially, my fascination was it was purely from a programming point of view. You know, um, the main programmer for Public Enemy was this guy named Eric Sadler. And I would watch him do things on a drum machine I'd never seen done before. I'd see him sequence things in a way that people have never, I've never seen people sequence before. Um, and so, but that and my technical knowledge of how to do things, we were, we made a, good, a pretty good team when we were working in the studio together. Now, I wasn't their only engineer. Public Enemy had like five or six engineers who worked at Green Street. We, we were all, they basically used all the staff guys. Um, and there were other people there, you know, like Nick Sansano and Rod Way, to name a couple, who did way more work on those records than I did. But, you know, I was there every day working with those guys. But, I mean, I think it's, it's more of an attitude thing. Like, Public Enemy, um, to me, it was just a hip hop version of a punk band. You know, what they were doing was so radically noisy and different than what everybody else was doing that, in its own way, I think they were like their own. They were they were a rock band. You know, actually, because they annoyed you know the establishment. They annoyed people who listened to you know quote unquote traditional music up until that point. You know, so anything. So, and that, I think that's the reason why, like, uh, at least I did. I got along with them in the engineering world really well because. I never complained about anything they'd asked for. Like, you know, they they do a, a track with a really noisy loop on it, and they say, that has to be the loudest thing in the song. I'm like, great, that's my favorite part, you know, and I'd push it up, you know. So um, it really wasn't, too, like, going into it, I was like, you know, how am I going to even make a difference as an engineer, as a hip-hop engineer? But if if you can just focus, it, focus in on one aspect of something that you're working on that you can relate to, you know, then you wind up absorbing the rest of it by osmosis, osmosis, you know. Um, and I think it's really important that you either listen to or write or work with people who don't necessarily work in the genre of music that you do. I mean, to be honest with you, the reason why I got the job working with Bob Dylan was because I'd worked at Public Enemy. I'd worked with a whole bunch of singer-songwriters prior to getting that job, and the person who pitched me to his manager was naming all these singer-songwriters I'd worked with. You know, like I'd worked, I'd done a bunch of stuff with Jeff Buckley. You know, not a lot, but you know, a, you know, a bunch of B-sides and remixes and stuff like that. And this guy was pressing all these, you know, singer songwriters I've worked with. And his manager's like, yeah, you know, Bob's worked with a ton of those guys, you know. Well, you know, what else has he done? The guy's like, well, you know, he used to work with Public Enemy and Ice Cube and, you know, run DMC. And he was like, really? 
you know, Bob loves those rappers. You know, at the very least, I'll have some interesting stories, and you know, he knows different ways of doing things, and that's the reason why I got the job. You know, like you, I. I which blows my mind, you know. It's crazy. You would never think of Bob Dylan as being into like, you know, all of that stuff, right? Well, he wasn't like he wasn't into hip hop per se, but he was into um, probably like, more than lyrically message. what Chuck was doing and how like they were like breaking barriers as far as what music could be. I mean, Bob may it's in, he may not like listen to something and say, "Oh, I really like that," but he might listen to something and say, "I, I get what they're doing," you know, and like. um and that's an, another really important thing too. You know, there are many styles in music that I personally I just don't like. You know, they don't do anything for me. But I think it's really important that you examine like music or a song that you may or may not like, but like loads of other people do, and try to figure out what it is in there that's making people like it. You know, Chuck D actually taught me that lesson a long time ago. We were watching some video on MTV, like Yo MTV Raps one afternoon, and like something really horrible came on. I can't remember. It might have been Vanilla Ice for all I know. Um, and I was like, oh my God, this is like the, the worst thing I've ever heard in my life, you know? And Chuck would look at me. He goes, yeah, yeah, but listen to this one little thing here. You know, that's the reason why people are buying it. And he picked up his napkin. We were eating lunch. He picked up his napkin, held it up. And he said, like, if this is the song, and he peeled, you know, tore off one little corner off the side of the napkin and said, this is the part that's really dope. This is why people are buying it. That's what you got to look for. And that really opened my eyes, you know, like, so, like, I can, like, for example, I'm not a big fan of Kanye West at all, but I can listen to his records and kind of go, yeah, I mean, this has nothing for me. It doesn't move me at all. It doesn't make me happy or sad or whatever, but I get why people like this. You know, I, I, I hear, I, I can hear and see, you know, the things that are clever about it that are catching people's ears. And that's really the most important thing about the music business, you know, there is, or even uh, being an engineer is to recognize and be aware of why people are, are are doing things and why people are you know gravitate sort of the things and then if you can assimilate that you can sort of use that as something in your toolbox to make mixes that you do better you know absolutely yeah I I love all of that man and I think it's it's such a it's such a great experience it's like such a great lesson to learn there of just like finding those little details and I and I think that. You know, your experience, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say that your experience in working with hip hop and kind of learning this different genre than what you wanted to eventually get into, you had mentioned like breaking the rules. And I feel like a large part of that was because you had a little bit of background in a different genre. So you were thinking of different things that other people hadn't had never thought of incorporating into the rock music. Yeah. You know, I, I've, there's like, you should always learn like three or four different ways of doing the same thing. You know what I mean? Like, um, Oh, Jesus. Um, so for example, uh, let's see if I can hold an example. Like back in the day, you know, like um, if you, you know, um, oh, Jesus, I'm just trying. Like, you know, here's, let me give you an analogy. Like if you're going to like um, boil, make, fill a pot of water for, for boiling pasta, right? You can pick up the pot and stick it under the, under the, the, the pasta and fill it with water and put it back on the stove. Or there's a really hard way of doing it was just taking a drinking glass, fill that drinking glass with water, walk over to the pot, pour it in, and just keep doing that over and over again. Now, you may think that like, well, why would anyone want to do that? But let's say you're, you're, you got a pot of boiling water and you just let it sit there and boil for like you know an hour and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I need like another seven, six cups of water in this pot to make pasta. Now you know it, take the glass and fill it with water instead of going to carry this you know, big pot of boiling water under the stove. And it's sort of the same thing in, you know, in, in recording. It's like, well, um, we can have the singer sing that background part for every chorus that there is. Or I can just fly it by copying and pasting from here to here to there. You know, back in the day before Pro Tools you didn't have that, what we would do is take like an S900 and sample it and then fly it in by hand, you know, into, into each chorus. Or you can sync up two multi tracks together and have the background singer sing the background part on the first chorus on the slave reel and then offset the slave reel to the master and then bounce it back to the master each part that has to be done. So you have to know like five or six ways to achieve the same result. Some may, one version may have a lot more fidelity or a better audio quality and the other way, you know, version may get you the same results, but less quality. Well, you have to weigh the option. Like, you know, what's more important here, doing it quickly and getting it done or like, you know, getting it done properly, you know? So it's sort of like, you know, when I get drum sounds for, you know, the record I'm working on, you know, I have to, you know, 
balance that? Like, where, how much time do we have in the studio today to do this? Do I have two hours to dial in like a fantastic drum sound for each individual element on the drum set? Or can I get away with just like throwing up some mics, getting a good level, doing a little bit of compression, a little bit of EQing to make it sound passable and then worry about it later, you know, in the, in the mix. So it's, so it's all about being quick on your feet and making quick decisions like that, you know, because the last thing you want to do is have a band sitting around for three hours while you have the drummer, you know, do this on a kick drum for an hour and a half while you figure out what the kick drum sounds when they're chomping at the bit, you know, to be playing and, and recording, you know, nothing worse than like crushing a band's enthusiasm while they're waiting for you to get sounds, you know, it's, there's so much technology available to us now that to me, it's more important to get the band playing and like maybe have a, a less than perfect, perfectly recorded track. I'd rather catch the performance than worry about the audio quality. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. it's that balancing act you have to take. It's like yeah. a, it's like working efficiently, it just for everyone's sake. You know, it's not just not yeah. just so you can like you know get the job done faster, but so that everyone keeps motivated, everyone's excited about it still. And, and exactly, has that exactly. You know, like you know, I like, Green Street was a it was a good studio, but they didn't have a really great mic locker. They didn't have like you know a shit ton of like uh, you know expensive large diaphragm compressors. I mean uh, condensers, and they had a like a just a good. Basic set, like a couple of 87s, you know, 421s, 414s, 57s, you know, like a really modest microphone collection, but I learned how to get the most out of it. So I have like this minimum requirement when I go to work at a studio and, you know, what equipment they should have. I can make a good record with just this small subset of equipment. And I know I can get something that's passable, like, like I can mix and make it sound better later. So I don't like get too hung up on making sure, I mean, if I can work at a studio that has a shit ton of gear, that's great. If I can work at Blackbird, hey, I'll work at Blackbird, you know? But, um, but if I can only work at this small studio, you know, in Brooklyn, you know, that has a small mic locker and a very modest amount of outboard gear, I can do it because I know how to, you know? I'm curious to know, like when when you say you just need like a minimal amount of gear, like what kind of gear are we talking about? Because because that's an, that's one thing that I find a lot of home studio musicians are like afraid of is like, oh, I like I got to spend tons of money on all this gear, or I can't do it without having expensive gear. So, you know, what what would you say are your minimum requirements? Well, I, well just, I mean, I don't know. Minimal requirements, like a good, you know. Mm, mm, the most important requirement is that the monitoring environment, the room you're in, is sounds good and it's accurate. Because you can't you can't make any decisions if your room doesn't sound good or if your monitors aren't accurate. And like I was talking to an engineer friend of mine a bunch of years ago, and he, he came up with a really great rule of thumb. He's like, the closer a piece of gear is to the speakers and or the speakers, or the closer the piece of gear is to the microphones. Those are the most important parts. The, in the input part and the output part of your gear chain is the most important. Like the, your computer and software kind of sits right in the middle. It, it, you know, as long as you have a good converter, which is closer to the source, it doesn't make a difference what kind of, uh, what you call it, DAW you have. You know, if your speakers are really good, and your amp is really good, you know, you can probably get, a, you can get away with, you know, um, you know, maybe a crappy, you know, a, a less than perfect mixer. You know what I mean? So the closer you are to the, to the input and the output of your signal chain, that's where you spend your money. And of course, in the output chain, the most important thing would be the room itself, you know, and then you just work your way backwards. I would say if you're a home recordist and you're a musician, like, you know, invest in a great, great set of speakers, invest in like one or two really high quality microphones, like a, a good, like large diaphragm compressor for vocals and stuff like that. And then maybe a good dynamic mic for like guitars, you know, like a, you know, hey, a 57 or, you know, a 421 or something like that. And then um, some really good speakers and a, and a good mic pre and a good, and one good EQ, like one or two good mic pre's and compressors and EQs is really all you need to do that. I mean, I've done entire records with a pair of Daking um, mic pre EQ strips and a pair of distressors. I mean, I've done entire records. I have like a, a gig bag with, you know, two of each that are wired together, you know, like one, one is one and one and one is the other one. And I've done entire records that way, you know, with musicians in their homes and they sound great, you know, as long as your input is, is quality and your output is quality, everything in the middle 
makes no difference. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's amazing. You mentioned like the 57. It's amazing how good the 57 can be and how diverse it is. And you, yeah. can, get, you can pretty I much mean, record anything with it, you know? <laughs> with one caveat, though, I mean, like every studio in the world has, you know, like a locker full of 57s. You know, you'll have like a milk crate full of 57s, you know? I mean, they're very versatile mics. They're very durable, but, you know, they do wear out. They do get kind of crappy, you know? Um, so yeah, like, they definitely can sound different from each other. Yeah, they do sound different from each other, but you know, a brand new fifty seven is gonna sound a lot better than one that's been kicking around in a studio for like the last ten years, you know. I I met I met an engineer once who who loved miking kick drums with a fifty seven. And the reason why he, he he figured out a way to get a great kick drum sound out of a fifty seven, and what he would do is he would just buy a new one for every record he did because they were so cheap. You know what I mean? He's like, because he's like, I this thing has been sitting in a kick drum for like a month. You know, the diaphragm is probably shot. No, no worries. I'll just give it to somebody who wants it, and I'll just buy a new one for the session. Because how much do they cost? A hundred bucks? A hundred ten bucks? You know? Yeah, yeah. I remember like when I first made that observation. Like I, I had bought a couple of used fifty sevens, and then I was like, "Why does this one sound so much brighter than the other?" You know, and like it's like, oh, because they are different. <laughs> they are different. Yeah, exactly. I mean, personally, I don't own me personally. I don't own that many microphones. You know, I generally rely on the studio I'm working at. You know, I've got a couple fifty sevens. I got a couple four fourteens. I got a couple of these mini RCA forty fours, like the forty four juniors. And a pair of uh, Daking, no, I'm sorry, um, excuse me, a pair of B&K 4011s, you know, which are these really nice pencil microphones I've had for ages now. I just love them to death on everything, you know. But I don't have that much gear in my studio, really. I, I, used, to have, I used to have racks and racks. I used to have like five or six racks full of outboard gear, and I've gotten rid of most of it, you know, just because, you know, like, well, you know, back in 2008, when the market collapsed, you know, I needed to get some quick cash, <laughs> so I had to sell some stuff, you know. And after a while, I just once the, once the mixing in the box became more and more feasible, I just, I just started shedding outboard gear, you know. So now I only have one rack of stuff. Yeah, well, sometimes going that minimalist approach kind of makes you realize what you can get away with as yeah, well, right? Exactly. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier, like you have a massive range of clientele in in different genres and and all over the place, really. What do you think it is about you that attracts such a diverse range of clients? Ah, uh, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I, I think my well, this may sound stupid, but I think my diversity gets me diversity. I don't know. I I, I just well, early on, I just never said no to anything. You know, I would just do any record that would come my way, you know, I, unless I, unless I just would get a demo and I just could not understand the music, which is rare, you know? Um, and that, I think it's just that your work and your attitude is probably more of a calling card than anything else. You know, I'm a pretty affable guy. I think, you know, I'm not a jerk in the studio. I'm, I'm pretty, um, uh, I, when, it, when it comes between the record label and the band, I'm always siding with the band. You know, I always defer to the band when making production decisions. You know, the only demand I ever make of any band that I work with is that if I have an idea, let's just try it. You know, before you shoot it down, let me try this idea and let me let me know what you think. You know, because you may not think it's a good idea, but let me, let's just try this one idea. You know, that's the only demand I make of any band that I work with. You know. Um, I've a large majority of my productions have always been co-productions with the band. You know, I take a co-production credit. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of it just has to be with attitude. You know, you, you, you know, I've never, um, like, you know, put my foot down and said, you know, I am the sole authority when it comes to how you get good sounds on things, you know, the, how dare you tell me how to do my job, that kind of thing. You know, like I've worked with bands and you know, guys are come to me and say, Hey man, you know, I know you, I know you're like the big, big Big shot engineer, but you know, at home, I, I I take like this really crappy Radio Shack PZM microphone and I stick it underneath my drum stool to record my drums. And there's something about that sound that I really like. I'm like, okay, sure, all right, and then just get a PZM put underneath the drum stool. I'll record that too, but I'll do my thing as well and let's check it out. And many times, I've gotten some of my best ideas and some of my best tricks from like musicians and bands who just you know tell me like how they do stuff at home. I'm like, well, I've never tried that before. What's the worst thing that's gonna happen? It's uh, it's not gonna sound good. And we won't use it. You know, it's like five minutes of time to set it up i'd rather if somebody in a band's got an idea and i know it's bad you know i'd rather take the 10 minutes to try that idea and have everybody in the room 
realize, yeah, that's a bad idea, then to throw my foot down and say, it's a bad idea and just shut it down and then have everybody just be like, yeah, that was a good idea, but Chris wouldn't let us do it. You know? Yeah, because once you shoot everyone down, then people are afraid to make those suggestions that are yeah, actually good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on, we're making we're making records, man. We're not like solving the Middle East peace crisis here. We're just, you know, it's the, what are the dire consequences? There very there are very little, there are very few dire consequences in making records. You know, so yeah, sure. Especially these anything. days, where yeah. you can like delete ideas so easily. You know, it's always yeah, tape exactly. Or- and 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 I think that's also one of the reasons. That's kind of how I've always kind of pushed my career a little bit further is, you know, whenever, you know, you should never be afraid to bite off a little more than you can chew. And when you do that, just ask yourself, well, what's the worst thing that can happen if I try to do this and I, and I don't, and I, and I fail it and I, and I fuck it up, you know, whatever. And 90% of the time it's stuff that's completely recoverable or it's just like no big deal. You know, like I worked at a band in the UK. I've told the story a million times, but I'll tell it again. I worked this band in the UK and it was brought to my attention that we we're going to be recording a 60 piece orchestra on like 50 songs on like, I'm sorry, five of the songs on this record. And we were at air studios and air studios in London in the big room, you know, and like we were using the London studio orchestra, which is the London symphony orchestra with, but with different first chairs, you know, and like, okay. And the band's like, Hey man, aren't you excited about recording the orchestra? And I, I leaned back and I went, well, how much is this costing us? And they're like, well, it's about 24,000 pounds, which is about, 50 grand, you know, in the US dollars. And I was like, well, okay, I've never recorded a full orchestra before. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? I can screw it up and I don't have $50,000 to rent and pay to do it again. So that was like one of the few times I said, well, you know what? We're at Air Studios in London. The house gear, the house engineers here do this every day. So why should I try to reinvent the wheel? Let's just get the house guy to do it, you know? And I sat there and watched that guy like a hawk. So now if somebody asked me to record a full, full orchestra, I know how to do it now. But at that point, I was like, mm, that's one risk I'm not going to take. But every other risk I've taken has always paid off in spades, you know? You know, like, hey, Chris, Chris, have you ever tried mixing in 5.1? No, I never did. And and I did a, a surround album, and I've never done it before. And it was a huge budget record. I was like, the worst thing that's going to happen, I'm going to do one mix. And people are going to be like, eh, let's get another guy to do it, which is fine. You know, take the break. And I did it, and everyone was happy. I was like, okay, well, I guess I can do that now. And <laughs> surround mixes, you know, for days on end, you know. Yeah. Well, man, I, I think that that's, that's also a really big lesson to learn there as well, like taking the risks, but also knowing knowing when – you know, when that risk is too much, you know, so uh, exactly. you know, that story yeah. of the orchestra thing, I think that's a great way to do it. Cause yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like we're trying to help people make their records and have their vision. And if we don't feel like we're capable of achieving that vision for them, then obviously like there's someone who knows how to do it. So it's, it's not competition at that point, you know, you're just helping people like find the right engineer to get the job done. And then you could still, at that point you've won over the band because you've, you've done what they needed. They, they got the result they needed. Exactly. Right? And you know, there are times where you might have to, you know, step, step away from a project or, you know, and like tell the artists you're working with, like, you know what, I may not be your guy. You know, there there have been there have been records uh, that I've been offered. You know, where I've listened to the demos and I kind of listen to it. And I kind of go, you know, there's not even one song here that makes me excited about doing this record. You know, like it's it's, it's an okay record, and I might not, I may not even have other work lined up that I can do instead of that record. But I might listen to a record and be like, I don't, I may not be your guy for this. You know, I'm willing to try, but you know, I think there are other guys who would be more excited about doing this record than I would be. And I, I think I'd be taking your money. Like there are a couple bands I turned down outright, which went on, you know, like <laughs> I'll give you an example. Um, I was working on a record from Geffen and the a and guy at Geffen said, Hey, you know, I got this band and they're getting ready to do their second record. And, you know, I told them, you know, about you and they'd be interested in taking a meeting. Uh, here's their last record. And so I'm like, check it out and tell me what you think. So I went home and I listened to their first record and it was like the Southern California ska kind of band, you know, and I'm not a big fan of ska music, like two, to- two tone ska from the seventies, England, definitely the English beat. I love that stuff, but there's something about American ska that just doesn't ring true to me. You know, I'm not knocking it or anything like that, but it, it, internally it does nothing for me. Right. I used to play and in a ska band, band, so I've heard all of the ska, <laughs> ska yeah, comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, and then and this is a, 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 you know, a ska band fronted by this female singer. And I was like, eh, no, 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 no I don't want to do it. You know? It, and the band was no doubt, and the record would have been Tragic Kingdom. You know what I mean? So, like, I had an opportunity to work on that record, and I just said no because I just 
didn't get it. Of course, I didn't get the demos. If I'd gotten the demos for what a bit, you know, for Tragic Kingdom, I definitely would have done it. You know, I mean, I, I turned down the boss tones on their on the record that wanted to having their one, the, uh, one big hit on it. You know, just because I was like, I, I just can't. I, yeah, I can't see myself in a room doing this twenty four hours a day for the next two months. You know, I'll, I'll wind up turning into a surly idiot. You know, and like everyone will realize I'm not into it, and then you know it'll just be a bad vibe. So no, I'm not going to do it. You know, but there, but there's something to the power of you saying no to that because that's obviously led to you having a, a much more uh, diverse career path and 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 working with a lot of bigger bands that you know it's it's not like that like it, who knows maybe you maybe you could have taken that no doubt record or like the boston's record or whatever and been pigeonholed yeah. as a ska guy you know what i mean so like yeah exactly it, you know it's probably um, giving you a lot more flexibility in your later career yeah i just think i just think you know you need to do as many different records you possibly you know different styles you possibly can like i have a uh, another engineer producer friend of mine who's really well known as like the hard rock dude you know he's done some massive massive records and he was in new york when i was working on a bob dylan record and he stopped by after the studio after everyone left and he was i was showing him around you know showing him the setup and stuff like that he was he just sat in a control chair and said i would give my left nut to do this record you know but i can't get anywhere near this record because people only know me for doing this one thing you know and uh I just refuse to get pigeonholed like that. I mean, I'm really well no known nowadays for the alt rock guy, you know, but I can, I can do it. I do a bunch of other stuff too. I just finished doing it like an electronic record, you know, a couple of weeks ago for, for a friend of mine, you know, for an art, a artist friend of mine, you know, that's completely different than what people are used to having, you know, hearing me do, you know, I just finished making a, a country record, you know, for some independent artist like two, two weeks before that. So, um, having your feet in as many different styles of music and, and immersing yourself in as many different styles of music, I think is really important. You know? Yeah, of course. And, and I, and I think going back to that idea, that idea earlier of breaking the rules, like with, the more you work in different genres, the more you learn different tricks, you learn different trends in that, in that genre as well. And you can incorporate those into new things. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it helps you work with different pieces of gear too. Like, um, there's this plugin I use quite a lot, um, made by this company called, uh, cable guys it's called volume shaper and um volume shaper uh basically lets you draw like a volume curve like a, a you know a, a volume envelope and it syncs to uh the tempo of the track and allows you to do that you know to simulate like you know how like in a lot of like dance music there's that whole thing about where you side chain the compressor on a keyboard track with a kick drum so it kind of pumps and it goes nick, nick, nick. and this plugin basically replaces all that rigmarole and you can actually draw on exactly how the, the volume you know ducks down when it goes up and I was working on an album that needed something like that. So I downloaded it and I was playing around with it and I got it to do what I wanted. And while I was poking around, I was looking at all the parameters and you can have it trigger and sync to the, the tempo of the track, or you can trigger the envelope with a, with a MIDI note. And then I was like, well, wait a second. If I drew like a gate envelope, like in a fast attack, hold, and then a release, and I triggered it with MIDI, and I used another plugin to generate MIDI notes, or let's say off the kick drum, I can use this plugin as a MIDI gate, you know, so that it, it'd be a perfect gate. And then once I, once I get all my triggers, you know, accurate to the kick drum, I don't have to worry about whatever I'm doing with the EQ. I can put the, I can put this MIDI gate after everything in the plugin chain and not have to worry about tweaking my threshold levels and stuff like that. And what's really cool about that plugin is that's multi-band. You can do a different envelope on three different bands. So I can have like the, the low end decay really long, and then I can have the, 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 the high end decay really fast so I can get rid of bleed and kick drums and stuff like that. And I wrote back to the the plugin company. It's like, you know, you got the, this is a great product, but you should also be marketing this as a, as a MIDI gate as well. And they totally changed some of their you know marketing materials as a result. And I never would have, never, never would have discovered this, you know, plug-in if I hadn't been working on an electronic record where I needed, you know, the ducking thing to happen really accurately. And now I'm using that electronically based or, you know, um, plug-in on a Bob Dylan record or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I wrote these guys like, you know, I'm using this on a, on a, on a Wilco record. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, how? Like, for what? You know, what on a Wilco record is being used for this? I'm like, well, I'm doing this with it, you know? So it, it, it having your having a little bit of knowledge of every genre keeps you aware of everything that you can do with gear as well you know so i'm always reading like uh, there's a great blog on um there's a great website called uh 
CDM, create digital music, and it's nothing but synthesizers and you know pro you know uh, soft synths and things that are going on electronic music. But I read it rapidly because every once in a while I pick up a little nugget out of there that I can apply to like my alt rock mixes. I'm like, oh well, that thing does that. I need something that does that to take care of this problem that I always have. You know? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of great tools out there that allow you to actually work smarter and that aren't necessarily even like musical things, you know, it's like this gating trick. Like most people don't think to use MIDI to, to, to trigger a gate, but Hey, if you can do it, like that, that gives you way more flexibility. It makes you work smarter. Exactly. It takes advantage of, you know, like I, I layer samples, you know, like I'll, I'll supplement the snare with a snare sample and the kick, et cetera, et cetera, like everybody on the planet does. So I'm always, gen I always, you know, I use this plugin by Massey called DRT which basically analyzes a, you know, a drum track and generates MIDI notes for it. And also generates an audio click for every hit kick drum as well. So I always, no matter what kind of a record I'm working on, whether it be electronic, uh, a Bob Dylan record, or some other alternative record, one of the first things I do before I mix is I, I, I generate audio and MIDI triggers for the kick and snare. Even if I'm not, even if later on in the mix, I wind up not using them at all, but they're always there because at some point during the session, I'm going to need it for something, you know, like, uh, well, yeah, I need to get, get this really noisy kick and I, I can't do it with a regular gate. So I'll use volume shaper and use the MIDI from the kick drum. Or sometimes like the drummer's playing a ride cymbal really, really, really quietly, but he's hitting the snare really loud. So if I try pushing the overheads up to make the ride louder, the snare gets really crazy loud. So I could take volume shaper, put it on the overhead track and have it duck on every snare hit using the MIDI from the snare that I generated. So like these, I spend 20, 30 minutes generating MIDI clicks and, you know, MIDI notes for the kick and snare. And that winds up being used, you know, like, you know, four or five hours later when I'm realizing I'm having a problem with something that I can solve with, with that stuff already. So like ses ses prepping your session and getting all that stuff squared away at the beginning just helps your workflow later on. Cause nothing more soul sucking than like being halfway through a mix and like, you got that nagging feeling like, yeah, I think I'm going to have to trigger a snare. I, and I don't have to go through all the problems. So you work, you work, you work, you work. And then like three hours later, you're like, yeah, all right, I got to trigger a snare. I can't, I can't do, you know, nothing I can do to save this. Then you got to stop your creative process and do the mind numbing work, generating MIDI notes for your snare so that you can get on with your work. So I always do all that stuff way, you know, way up front, you know, because I'm a one man shop. I don't have an assistant, you know, who preps all my sessions for me, you know. So when you say you're doing it all ahead of time, like are you you're, you at least have like a snare drum that you're triggering things off of, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm working with the clients, you know, audio tracks, you know. Yeah, gotcha. But I, you know, I have a, I have a, you know, I have a, a handful of kick sounds and a handful of snare sounds that I've made myself over the course of the years that I really like to use, you know, in my productions, you know. Um, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that's awesome. I, I love hearing those kind of like workflow hacks because so many people don't talk about them right we, we well, always yeah. talk about eqing and compression but like there's these other things that actually make a big difference well if i'm gonna, if i can make a plug for another workflow hack it's there's this a uh, great amazing program that you may or may not have heard of called soundflow um it's this uh, macro program that lets you script pro tools and have it do a bunch of stuff by just hitting one key and i've been using it for about a year now and i'm also a developer for them now because I, I posted a whole bunch of scripts on their forum and then the the main guy behind the, the company christian called me up and he emailed me he says you're writing really great stuff do you want to be a developer and i'm like yeah sure so not only am i an engineer now i'm like a software writer as well amazing <laughs> you know, but there's but like for example like i wrote a, a, a bunch of scripts that i put in a package called track data utilities and very simple things but it helps my workflow really really you know really a lot um, let's say I have a, um, for example, like you'll be working on a background vocal track. Let's say you've got like three background vocals they are all singing in unison and you solo the first one and you spend like, you know, 20 minutes EQing, compressing, you know, adding a delay compression and routing it and color coding it and assigning it to a BCA and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. And you get that one background vocal sounding great. Now you got to copy all that stuff that you just did to the other three background vocal tracks, you know? So um, I have a, a script called copy track data. You highlight the track, hit copy track data. It copies all the information about that track. Then you select the other four background vocal tracks and you hit paste data and just copies all the plugins, all the sends, all the, the routing, all the BCA assignments, the color coding, all stuff onto those tracks. Or you can copy the track data and paste just the inserts or just paste just the sends or whatever. 
and I have another another pair of commands. One will just you know get rid of all the plugins on the track, and another one will get rid of all the sends on the track. You know, so if you get somebody else's session and you like the way it's set up, but you want to do everything from scratch, you can just highlight all the tracks and say delete, you know, inserts and delete sends, and then bang, you're ready to go. Yeah, that's amazing. I signed up for for Soundflow maybe a couple months ago, and I've totally been using your macros and not even <laughs> didn't even know it was you. <laughs> yeah, it is one of the more popular ones. It was funny because when Christian called me up, he goes, "You know, we're we're going to be selling scripts in the store, and I really wish I'd seen these before you put them up for free because I would have told you to sell them." <laughs> <laughs> it, it's such an incredible program, and yeah, I think there's a little bit of a learning curve for for some people, but it's like. It just makes the process so much faster. Yeah, and, anything uh, you can do yeah. to get rid of drudgery, you know, I'm all for. You know, so I always try to do all the drudgery at the beginning of a mix, you know, so that way, as I'm, you know, after I get everything all set up and you know, uh, and prepped the way I want it, it's just mixing, you know, at that point. Um, it was funny. I had a friend of mine uh, come down here a couple of weeks ago, a buddy of mine from college, and he had me mix a few tracks for him. And he was like sitting around for like an hour or two watching me just prep things. He was like, God, you know, he's like looking at his watch. He's like, uh, what's going on, Chris? I'm like, don't worry about it. Cause like basically mixing for me is like this, it's, it's, just, it's this logarithmic curve. You know, it seems like nothing is going on for like an hour, an hour, an hour. All of a sudden things start to happen. All of a sudden it's just like lots and lots and lots of productivity. And before you know it, I'm done, you know? So if, if I take like five hours to do a mix, like the first three hours seem like I'm just like focusing on the most mundane stuff. But once I get past that, it's really, really fast. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's amazing. I love that. That it, it, no, it just, that. That's such an important thing because, you know, you've clearly established what your workflow looks like and it's, it works for you. So, I mean, if it works for you, it works for you. That's the important thing, right? Yeah. I mean, if you find yourself doing, you know, the same thing over and over again, like in Pro Tools, you know, like if you're, if you want, if, if you find it, you gravitate to using the same four plugins on vocal tracks, for example, you're stupid not to make a track, pre track preset for that. So that when you open up another session, you just highlight the track and then load up the preset and go. I mean, just because you're using a preset doesn't mean you're, you're phoning it in. You know, you're, that for me, a preset is just a starting point, you know. You know, for example, like my background vocal preset has like a, a Fab Filter Pro uh, EQ on it, and it's the, the the high pass filter is automatically set at like a hundred. You know, because I I know I'm going to do that eventually. You can like you know filter out all the rumbles. So like, just why not have it there to start with? You know. Um, yeah, I think, so I think a lot of people think of templates as like, all of my mixes are going to sound the same, but it's like, no, no they're it's not. It's just a starting point. It's like, you know, like I was saying before earlier about having a bare minimum requirements for making a record. You know, that's what a template is. That's just like the, the starting point. Like if I know if I just start here, things are going to go pretty quickly. And, you know, it's, it's just to keep things organized. You know, organization is more important than anything else. You know, so once you get your session organized and you, and you have everything showing up in the same place, you know, on the screen or on your control surface, you know, what have you, any, you know, because just setting that stuff up every time you start a mix is just, you know, it, it's, it's a waste of time. Yeah. You're just getting rid of so many like boring mechanical tasks that take you away exactly. from being creative. Yeah. And, and, in, and back before Pro Tools, you know, I'd, I work with, you know, bands who like work with like big name mixers, like, you know, Chris and Tom Lord Alge and Jack Joseph and all those dudes. And they're like, yeah, man, you know, like he's got like, all the stuff he patches everything into the same channel on his console. Like you know, the vocal is always on this channel. It's always got all these compressors and everything already patched in for it. And I used to think, man, that's lazy. You know, every mix should be a unique thing. And then as I got older, I was like, geez, that's like the I was, that was so stupid of me to think that. You know, of course that's the best thing to do. Have it ready to go. You know, it's one of those things where like the first time you actually implement it and you see how much time you've saved, you're like, oh shit, why why haven't I been doing it like this way forever? Yeah, I mean it's funny because I remember for years when I was starting out as an engineer, I was I would struggle to get drum sounds and like I talked to you know engineer friends of mine or people I looked up to is like, God, I'm, I'm just struggling. And how do you get a good drum sound? And they would look at me and say, start with a good drummer, you know? And the first time I worked at a really great drummer, I was like, holy shit, this is easy, <laughs> you know, or a great, or should I say a great drummer in a great room on a, on a great kit, you know, like, like I said, that's the stuff that's at the end of the, you know, the, the beginning of the audio chain. If you start with a great song, a great drummer on a great kit in a great room, whoo, there you go. You know, but the thing is, if you're starting out and you don't have access to that stuff and you're working with substandard equipment, you know, and you have to pull your hair out to wrestle a great sound out of really not great gear, 
I mean, yes, it's a limitation, but in the long run, that winds up being a really helpful thing for you to go through. You know, it's like learning how to play guitar on a, on a really crappy guitar with a high action. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's so hard to play and you spend a year learning guitar on this crappy, crappy, crappy guitar. And then you buy your first great guitar and it's like, oh my God. And then like you're playing like a million times better because all that struggle is gone. You know, you can just, you know, you know fly on the fretboard, you know? So like, so if you're struggling with gear and you're wishing, oh man, I wish I had better gear, stick with it for a while. You know, like learn how to get as much as you can with the with the gear you've got, because then when you get the gear that you want, it's going to be a walk in the park, and people are going to think you're a genius because you're using these tricks to get great sounds out of bad gear. If you use that same those tra- same tricks to get great sounds out of great gear, oh my God, you're going to get great sounds. You know? Of course, yeah, that, that that's a really great point because I, yeah, I think people chase this like this idea of. I need amazing gear to get good results, but it's like, I mean, truthfully, if you don't know how to use that gear to begin with, no, no amount of good gear is going to do, do anything for you. So exactly. Um, it, and it's, you know, and I, you know, I'm really happy that the, that the recording process and, and the knowledge for recording has been really democratized over the last 20 years, you know, like to learn the stuff that I learned, you had to like, work at a studio and work under other engineers. And now this stuff is just like a YouTube video, you know, click away. Although there's a lot, but that's the problem. There's also a lot of bad advice on YouTube, on on YouTube. And the other thing about the extreme democratization of getting sounds, you know, to sound like some, some other record or whatever, is that everybody starts to sound like everybody else. Like if, you know, an artist, if like an engineer comes up with this really cool method of doing something, he gets a very unique, identifiable sound, then four or five plugin companies are going to come up with a plugin that kind of emulates that sound. That, now everyone's got that sound. Now everybody's sounding that way, you know? So um, it's a great thing. It's a good thing. And it's a bad thing. It's a blessing and it's a curse. You know, like those plugins should be like being able to get the same, you know, guitar or drum sound as somebody like Andy Sneap or whatever, you know, that's great. It's going to get you, if you, especially if you're a songwriter, you know, and are in a band, that's great. You got to have something like that. So that way you're not just, you're uninspired because you have a really crappy sound, but as a mixer, engineer, the producer, that should just be a starting point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It can be inspiring sometimes, right? Yeah, I'm not ashamed to to admit. Yeah, I use presets. Sometimes I'll just like I'll be I'll get a a snare drum, you know, from an engineer and I'm listening to it and I'm like, oh, man, I have no idea what to do with this, you know. So I'll open up like the Andrew Shep's Omni Channel plugin or whatever and I'll just start clicking through presets, you know, and be like cuz I have no idea what to do with this thing, you know. I don't have any any idea. But a preset will, will inspire an idea, you know, like I'll I'll hit something and kind of go, "Well, that's really o- way over the top, but it's doing something that I like, you know, what if I dial that knob back? And what if I dial the you know, then now you're in that rabbit hole, you know, but, um, presets are a great way to learn how compression works or how EQ works, but it, it shouldn't be like, well, this is the, you know, the, the CLA snare drum preset. So I got to use that and not touch it because that's the way CLA would do it. No, that's not, that's not it. That's just yeah. the starting point. You know? Exactly. And, and the thing I always tell people too, with presets is that like, Unless you know the type of material someone had when they made that preset, yes, you don't exactly. know how that preset's going to work in your mix. And so then you're reverse engineering it. And if you have to reverse engineer it, you might as well just make it half the time, you know, because then you can like get the right settings for your particular sound and what, what's going to work for your particular mix. So mm-hmm. you just have to you be know, careful. It's also, but they're also really good. You know, it, it, you know, they're very good if you're pressed for time. You know, like sometimes, um, like I remember when I first checked out the the CLA bass plugin, you know, that's kind of going through it. And I, most of the presets, I was like, eh, that's not what I would do. I would, and that's not, those aren't sounds I like, but then there was one preset, I think it was called piano wire or something like that. And I, I hit it and I went, that's what I do. That's, that's the sound that I get. You know, it's got a lot of bit upper mid range and there's a little bit of chorusing on it. Well, that's really cool. And I tweaked it a little bit, but I never really use that. But if I'm doing a rough mix for a band, like I get out of the studio in five minutes. Yeah. I'll call that up and just throw it on and then turn one knob and be like, yeah, that's close enough. Go. Yeah. You know. that, that, yeah, that's awesome. That's a great, great little tip there. Um, one thing that I did want to ask you about is like when I listen to your records, one thing that really stands out to me is that you have this amazing ability to get super beefy yet clear and wide guitars. And <laughs> I, I don't know. There's just something about it, and and like a great example of it, I think, is like that Weezer Blue record. I, I just think that the the guitars sound incredible on that. Um, I was wondering if you have any like secret tips or whatever you want to share about mixing guitars. I, well, 
I, I, I think I do a good job of mixing guitars because I'm a guitar player myself. You know, I grew up playing guitar in really crappy cover bands or whatever, you know, and I know there is a certain, there are certain sounds that like as a guitar player, if I'm standing in front of an amp and I get it and there's a certain sound coming out of that amp, it just makes me feel good. You know, like, like it rattles my pants and makes my, you know, makes my t-shirt like, you know, move a little bit or whatever. And it, and it hits me in the chest a certain way. And so my my goal is is sort of like to kind of emulate that, but coming out of a speaker at a much lower, you know, a much lower level. You know, like how can I make this NS10 or my the speaker I use or my Genelex? How can I make my Genelex sound like a mini miniature guitar amp and have that sound kind of like poking through? So a lot of the the biggest thing, the most important thing to do is to go out and listen to the amp. You know, the, be in the room with the guitar player while he's playing and kind of get a vibe for like the dynamics he's doing, you know, what kind of, you know, is, you know, like, for example, growing up, like, you know, Eddie Van Halen was like the big greatest guitar player in the world, you know, and he had this certain sound, you know, and then I remember the first time I played in front of a Marshall, you know, cranked to 10, you know, with a humbucker pickup and I, you know, played a chord and I muted the strings and I went, jum, 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 you know, like, like, like unchained by Van Halen, whatever. I'm dun, 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 dun. And the way that whole thing, you know, made my chest run. I was like, oh my God, that's the greatest sound in the world. So I know how that feels in a way as a guitar player. And so I want to kind of get that feel out of the speakers as well. So I, I will do anything to, to get that, you know, to get us, if I hear a sound in my head, I will twist as many knobs, throw on as many plugins as possible to get that sound. Um, but how do I get that like recording to me? It's just, you have to go out there and listen to the amp and listen to what the guitar player is doing and, and find out what kind of, uh, expressivity he's trying to, that he's coaxing out of his amp, you know, like is, uh, is he doing that? Like, you know, um, like a modern metal kind of thing where everything is just sort of buzz and like very non-dynamic, you know, or is he uh, like a blues player? And like, every time he, he, when he, when he plays a note on a when he plays a note on the G string, does he scrape the pick across the, like the lower three strings first before he hits the G? It's going to ring. And when he does that, does the amp kind of rattle a little bit? You know, so like, so that's part of the sound. So when you're inside dialing it in, you know, it's not your job to get rid of it. You, you, your job there is to enhance that. You know, so it's I think the the the. The part about mixing that's most important, at least for me, is to get a clear picture in your head of what of what the final sound is going to be and how that uh, guitar sound is going to interact with the rest of the track and the rest of the band. You know, like, for example, Weezer, the whole idea was like the guitars are going to be the loudest thing in a mix. That was sort of like the concept going in. It's like, we want our guitars to be louder than like creep by radiohead you know we just want it to be like it's and we want the guitars and the bass to be basically one big 10 stringed instrument you know so that was sort of the the overall concept that the band and and rick okasic and myself had going in there so it was sort of my job just just to carve out the frequencies on both instruments to make it make it so you know um but a lot of it is just mic placement and mic experimentation you know, moving things around, you know, like some people put mics in front of an amp and then never touch them, you know, they go in there and they'll EQ things and flip bays and like, and just try to carve out the sound without actually going out there and just try moving a mic over an inch because like that makes a profound difference on, on the sound of a guitar. Like literally just get a 57, put it in front of a single speaker, put it in the center of the cone, record it, record a guitar part, go back out there, move it over toward the edge by two inches, record the exact same thing again, listen to it. You'll direct, it's almost like two different amps sometimes, you know? And the idea is trying to figure out how to carve out and, and get the best of each part of the speakers. So that's usually, usually why I use two microphones on an amp. It's usually a 57 and the second mic would either be like a, a ribbon microphone like a Royer, or if I don't have a Royer, a 414 would, would be that, you know. And then sometimes I'll also experiment with another microphone about 10 feet back away from the amp, just point it straight at it, you know. And, you know, blending that mic in can be a little tricky. You might have some phase issues, but sometimes that's kind of the thing. Sometimes that's the thing you need, you know. Um, I don't know, like the, I remember during during Weezer, the, the whole time getting no sounds was I would, I I was using a 57 and probably a 421 on all those amps. And what I would do is I would bring up both faders and adjust the mic pre so they're equal volume. And then I would flip one of them out of phase and 
bust them together, and obviously it would cancel out. And the resulting frequency, for me, I would try to get the most, I would try to place the mics so that when they were too out of phase, the really annoying frequency that I was trying to get rid of the amp would be there. So that when I put them back into phase, the, the annoying frequency would be out of phase. You know, so I always try to get like that weird sizzle at 3K to like cancel out via, you know, mic placement, you know. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great trick. I like that a lot. Yeah. You know, so in other words, like, you know, if I put the mics at a phase and I was getting this really great bottom end, this really great mid range, then the mic placement is wrong <laughs> because, you know, when I, when I put, put everything back in phase, that's going to cancel. That's going to, those are going to be the frequencies that disappear. So then it's oh, I got to go back out there and move the mics around again. So I just kind of keep doing that until I, you know, I found a good spot. And generally I would place the mics about, I just put my hand between the, the spe- you know, lengthwise between the, the speaker and the grill, you know, from one knuckle to the lat, you know, my pinky knuckle to my index finger knuckle. That's how far away it would be from um, the speaker grill. Not because there's any magical formula, it's just I don't have to carry a ruler around and that kind of seems to work for me. You know, it's like, what is it, like three and a half inches or whatever, you know, the width of my hand, you know. Sometimes you got to get creative you- with your measuring tools, right? <laughs> yeah, so I just, you know, you know, I just use that and... As, as my starting point and then move things around and uh some other tricks too and i had this issue with a record i just finished mixing is uh the band self-recorded everything and the guitar player doubled everything but he doubled everything with the same guitar and the same amp and the same effects chain and like half the time i couldn't even tell if, i was like well wait a second did you and he was a very accurate player and i couldn't tell if he was reamping like a di signal you know, with two different amps because the performances were so tight or whatever. He goes, oh, no, no, I just, you know, I just double tracked everything. And I was like, did you use the same amp and the same guitar? He goes, yeah. I was like, well, then what are you doubling? You know, it's just, it's it's, it's the same thing. Oh, when you do your double track, try to change something, either a setting on the amp or move the mics back a little bit or closer a little bit, change the guitar so that they're just not so exactly the same. They don't have to be black and white different, but they should, there should be some sonic differences between the two. Otherwise, it just sounds like one big wide mono track, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even just like the yeah, the pickup is something so small that you can do to, to yeah, to just change the pickup, you know, yeah. go to the middle position or uh, you know, d- dial down the tone on your on your on the guitar or you know, use a different fuzz box or like I said, just move the mics back a little bit from the amp. That makes them, you know, like an inch. You know, yeah, it's almost like you kind of want to sometimes have like a bit of a darker side and a bit of a brighter side with your yep. with your mm-hmm. mix, right? Exactly. That's very cool. Something that someone told me like literally yesterday, and I have not confirmed this, I haven't listened to it, is that with the Weezer Blue album, there was zero reverb on that album. Is there yes. is that true? Absolutely true. Absolutely true. I had to beg the band to use room microphones. You know, because I put room microphones, I was like, what are the room microphones for? Let's hear room microphones. I played them. They were like, that sounds like reverb. I'm like, but it's not reverb, it's the room, you know? <laughs> and like Rick and I had to like really we had like I think we had like a half hour conversation about that with the band. Like, look, it's it's not reverb, it's room, it's it's how you hear things in the room, you know. But literally the band would walk into the control room every day and like walk up to the outboard rack and turn off all the reverbs, you know, like <laughs> literally just power them off, you know. And I would turn them on like halfway through the day just to, you know, you know, to mess with their heads and stuff like that. And um I remember there were, there's like no reverb, there's no delays. But I remember when we were mixing only in dreams, there was like at the end where there's like that little build up section. There's like all these little feedback things are going back and forth. And Rivers was like, I wish that feedback note lasted just a little bit longer. And he kind of looked at me and like very sheepishly looked at me and says, Can we put a little delay on that just to make that last like just a half second longer? <laughs> and I got up and I went, What? <laughs> you know, I was like, Get the calendar, mark it down. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So yeah, but it's completely dry. The whole record, like so. I, so clearly, that was like you guys had discussed this ahead of time, and that was part of the sound. Oh yeah, it was the for. concept because they, they did their demos at some studio, and they loved how dry it was, and they were just like, we, we just we want it to be just bone dry. We don't we don't want anything resembling anything that sounds like arena rock at all. And I totally was with it. I was like, that's less work for me. You know, I don't have to spend time. You know, trying to shoehorn a reverb into this mix. You know, it's just. What it is, what it is. Um, but I, I, I distinctly remember we had. I did a remix for um, uh, what is it? Say it ain't so. They wanted to change something in say it ain't so for the single. It was a very, very minor thing. Like on the on the original original pressing, the first run pressing of say it ain't so. 
uh, the chorus guitars, like the bow down, bow down. Say, um, I actually muted in between each of those chord hits because there was all this feedback and noise on it. So it was very clean. It was like down, 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 down. Say it ain't so. And then the band was like, you know, we got this rough mix where those mutes aren't there, and the guitar is feeding back between the chords, and it's kind of messy. And and can we just recall the mix and get rid of the mutes because we want to put those in the video? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know. So. You know, we mix it electric lady. We booked the same room. I got the assistant and I was walking to, you know, I got a phone call that morning from the the assistant who hadn't worked on the original record, but he was working with me on the remix. He's like, I'm recalling the the mix. And there's like, I, I think we're missing some recall notes here because there's like no outboard gear here. And I was like, let me guess. There's like an 1176 on the bass. There's an 1176 and a 160 on the vocal maybe. And there's like... Uh, there's probably a pull tech on the on the kick drum. He's like, yeah, that's it. I'm like, yeah, that's it. You know, everything else is the console. It's the SSL. He's like, he's like but there's no reverbs. There's no <laughs> d- delays. I'm like, no, that's right. You know, and I literally went in there, checked recall. You know, you know, erased the mutes on the on the guitars and the choruses, and reprinted the mix again. You know, and that's actually now the the official mix on all the subsequent uh, releases of the Blue Album. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. But yeah, like that, it was literally one page of notes for the recall. You know, and normally it's like 10, 12 pages, you know, with all the settings of every piece of outboard get written down. No, that was, was pretty much all done, the SSL, you know, like on the board. Very little, very little of any outboard gear. You know? That's incredible. Yeah, I was, I was curious about that because I wasn't sure if like that was part of getting the guitars to sound so big on that record was just not having anything the ambient to, to make yeah, them I mean, sound it's muddy. Just, like, it's, just, it's just two guitars, you know, left and right hard left and right and you know bass up the middle you know uh, very few exceptions you know that's all it is if there's a lead guitar obviously there'll be an overdubbed lead guitar there'll be a, so there'll be a third guitar but yeah just two rhythm guitars bass drums done you know all the way across the board yeah i, I think so many i think so so many times people think that we need to like add effects for the sake of adding effects and now that I've heard, now that I know that this album has no effects on it it's, it's incredible <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's powerful my whole you know like I always, I mean, it's weird. Like for years after that, people were always asking me, like, "Can we get this sound?" You know, we like to lose this record. So for years, I was the, the dry guy. You know, like I'm, I'm the dry guy. You know, Chris is the guy you go to if you want no effects. You know, if you want dry, and I'm still pretty much like that. Um, but you know, I, I put I put reverb guitars all times. I put sm- small rooms, you know, on guitars just to put them in a space. Sometimes everything having everything just bone dry. Does, is, isn't appropriate, you know, for the song. But like when I'm tracking a record that I'm producing, you know, when I'm doing rough mixes at the end of the day, with rare exceptions, it's almost always dry. I mean, I always do my rough, rough mixes bone dry because for me, it's just sort of like, obviously, depending upon the genre. But if you can get a rough mix at the end of the day with no effects on it, and it's and the song sounds finished, then you're done. You know, if you're having to put reverbs and stuff like that to get it to sound, you know, to, to make it sound fuller or denser or whatever, then maybe you still need to do more work on it. You know, like to me, like if you can get a rough mix sounding really good and it just sounds like the band playing in the room, th- then you're there. And then at least at the, when you go to the next stage to mix, now you've got all this room to experiment. You know? mm-hmm. So you're mainly getting your ambience from room mics. Yeah. I'm a huge, uh, I, I get everything from room mics. You know, usually what I do at the end of a, like once I get a take from the drummer that I really like, before he comes in a room, I just have him hit the snare a couple of times and the kick drum a couple of times and I record individual hits across the kit. And then a lot of times what I'll do in the mix, depending upon the drummer, of course, is that I'll trigger like a snare room sample you know, in the mix. So it's the same snare in the same room for the same song. So it doesn't sound like a sample. It just sounds like the snare is taking up a lot of space in the room. So if you've got a drummer who doesn't really know how to balance himself really well, and like in the choruses, he's just thrashing away on the crash cymbal and this, and, and your room mics are just obliterated with, you know, with this wash from the cymbals. If you've got a kick and a snare room sample, and you're triggering that off the kick and the snare. Well, what you can do during the chorus is you can lower the real room microphones and then push up the samples a bit more, but it doesn't sound artificial because it's the same snare room sample from the same snare drum from the same day from the same performance. And you can sort of rebalance the drums in the room per se, you know, and uh, that's t- that's gotten me out of trouble a, a gazillion times, you know, a gazillion. I, I do it. I do it all the time. I'm always triggering. 
uh, room samples, even with other productions, you know, when I get asked to mix other people's songs, more than likely I'm triggering a, a, a snare ambience and a kick ambience, especially if it's like, you know, recorded by the band in their bedroom and there's like no room mics to, to deal with, you know, just having a good set of room samples is really important. Yeah, that's another great workaround or uh, workflow hack. You know, just having having those clean hits that you can rely on when you when you can't get that cleanliness out of the original tracks. Yeah, again, you know, going back to what I was talking about before, the first thing I do when I sit down to uh, the mix is I make triggers for all the kicks and all the snare hits. You know, and that's the reason why I do it because eventually, at some point, I'm like, ah, oh, man, these room these these drums need to be a bit roomier. Hey, let's trigger these samples. Oh, I'm all ready to go. I'm all set to go because I got I've already set up my triggers. You know, well, sometimes I'll, I'll again I'll spend a half hour generating triggers and then I never wind up never using them, but better to have them there than not have them, you know? Of course. Yeah. Well, a- another album that you worked on that I wanted to ask you about, I love the sound of the motion city soundtrack album, commit this to memory. And, and, and one thing I love about that album is how much movement there is between the different sections of the songs, like between verses and choruses. To me, like the choruses always feel like they explode. And I was wondering when it comes to creating dynamics in a mix, like how much automation are you doing? I mean, a lot of that is is an arrangement, you know. You know, like I I kind of remember with Motion City that uh, like when choruses would kick in, there would be a whole metal layer of guitars that would also you know like be introduced, you know. And but what's really important when you when you you when you layer guitars or add more guitars in the choruses is that those guitars really need to sound different than the guitars that are continuously through the track. You know what I mean? So like if you have like a really crunchy guitar sound running through an entire song. And the chorus comes in, it's very tempted just to add another set of crunchy guitars on top of that. But I always am a fan of like doing less crunchy guitars, you know, and to, to double things up and so that the chorus guitars have a little more definition, you know what I mean? And, and, and rhythmically, they're doing something that's a little bit more exciting because now you're hearing the individual hits and stuff like that. And it, it, it just makes that freight train, you know, kick into gear, as it were. Um, but yeah, I mean, autom- yeah, obviously, I, automation is. is I'm, I'm constantly writing faders, you know, in Pro Tools. I have, I, I don't use a mouse and on screen. I have a pair of um, which one call it S1, you know, the, the Avid S1 controllers. I have uh, 16 channels worth, and uh, I'm always doing like fader rides and stuff like that, you know. Um, and some, you know, there, there are a lot of little tricks you can do to 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 simulate that push when the chorus comes in. Um, you can um, do um, things like, for example, I'll have a master fader, like not a, not like, like all my, for, for example, I mix, um, when, when I'm mixing, all my drums go to a subgroup, all my p- basses go to a subgroup, you know, my guitars go to a subgroup, and then those groups feed an aux track that is my master, I, I basically treat as my master fader. But then you also have in Pro Tools the master fader, which will control the levels of everything going through that bus. So, you know, you can do, you can have a master fader for your stereo mix and then push the, the overall level of the mix up a DB, which in turn hits your compressors a little bit harder and all of a sudden makes the mix sound denser. And then you can also supplement that with a volume ride on the master fader as well. You know, so now the mix gets a little louder and a little crunchier and a little thicker. You know, that's one always always one good trick. Yeah, riding the, the faders is really important. Even if you just like highlight you know, all the automation in that one section, bring everything down or bring everything up, you know, by even like a DB, DB and a half makes a massive difference, difference in how things hit, you know. Uh, I have a friend of mine who actually, what he does in the verses, he'll actually pan the entire mix in ever so so slightly. And then when the chorus kicks in, he, he puts everything hard, you know, he pans the mix hard, you know, out left and right, you know. Or you can use the stereo widening thing on, on, the, on the stereo bus and just widen the mix ever so slightly beyond the, far left and far far right so it just sounds like the mix just got bigger you know or just you know pan the guitars in and out you know put, the, all, you, put all your rhythm guitars slightly in during the verses and when the chorus kicks in you know pan them out hard left and right and it may not be an obvious change but a lot of little subtle changes add up to one big change you know when the chorus comes in you know and it's just a matter of exper- it's a matter, matter of experimenting you know and also it's really important like um to um to get some distance from the mix. I never, I mean, yeah, I can do a mix in a day, but I almost always, 99% of the time, will always put it away and come back in the next day and listen to it with fresh ears to make sure I, I didn't miss something or that maybe I might have overcooked it. Because as you get tired and as your ears wear out, you add too much hot top end, you might you know compress the overall mix way too hard. You know, all of a sudden it just sounds like this flat, 
monodynamic thing and you're like oh i overdid it on the compression or right, back things up a little you know back things off a little bit but you need to get away from it for a few minutes and then or or a few hours or a day or so and then and listen to it again with a very open mind you know so like lately for me when i've been mixing is i've been trying to do mixes as quickly as possible because i i really actually enjoy doing revisions i know a lot of engineers hate doing revisions for bands like it's like the worst thing in life they think but the thing i noticed a couple of years ago when i was doing revisions is that you wind up doing a revision for a mix at least a week after you've completed it you know because you'll send you'll, you do the mix you'll send like four mixes to the band you'll have to wait for them to like listen to it for a couple of days and they get all the notes and then they get their notes back and all the things they want to change and by that point you've pretty much forgotten all the things you've done on individual tracks like oh you don't remember that you spent like you know two hours you know with a multi-band compressor trying to tame the the, the, the top mid-range of the bass you know because it was clicking too hard and like you spent all this time doing this and at that point you're just hearing the mix and then you're, and you're looking at all these things that the these notes that the the band gave you that they want to change and then at that point you're not really married to anything so when you read that note it's like yeah the bass we need a little more click in the top end and like in the back of your mind you're thinking well yeah i spent a lot of time doing that trying to control that but they want it back hey no problem i'll just put it back and you know and you basically step by step you go through all of your vision you do it and so I've been actually doing mix, trying to do mixes as fast as possible so that I can come back the next day and listen to it as a whole thing. Because it's a lot easier to tweak an existing mix, in my opinion, than it is to actually do a mix from scratch. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but like once a mix is complete, you can. it's a lot easier to get lost in the details knowing that it's all done than spending, you know, sweating the kick and snare drum sound, you know, for, for the first hour of your mix and kind of like, like going, oh, is this right or whatever? So when I'm mixing, I try to get to the vocal as quickly as possible. It's like I always get like the rhythm section going, like kick. I mean the drums, the bass, and the main chordal instrument, whatever that may be, like the guitar or keyboard or whatever. And I try to get that basic trio going, and then I get the vocal in and I start dialing effects for the vocals, rhythmic effects, and all that stuff. And then I start putting in the rest of the band. And then like once I get to the point where it's like I can listen to it from beginning to end without wanting to grab a fader and change a level. So I'm like, okay, I'm done. I mean, I'm not hundred percent done, but I'm pretty much there and I'll save it and I'll put it away, work on the next mix. And then two days later, I'll listen to that first mix again. And then it's like, oh, okay, these are all the details I need, you know, because I was so engrossed in all this other stuff that I'm not realizing that like, oh yeah, you know what? I need a delay in that one word in the vocal and the chorus. And oh yeah, I need to punch up that guitar when he comes in on the chorus. And hey, nothing's happening on the lead up to the chorus. What can I do to make that more exciting? You know, because that's just, it's that stuff like that's easier to do once you have a complete basic mix going. Yeah, know? that makes a lot of sense. You're you're working on the the mix as a song the next day, as opposed to like the, that initial day where you're like getting so micro with every little fader exactly. and everything, right? Yeah, I mean, like I remember like when we finished the Weezer record, like on the last day in the studio, we did a playback of the, of the whole album, listened to every mix that we did, you know, and we sat there and listened to it. And the whole time I was just sitting in the corner going, oh God, I, I, I want to remix this whole thing because I'm hearing all this stuff that I wanted to do. And I didn't do it. And like, oh, I hate this record, you know. And then like, you know, two weeks went by, we went to master and we mastered it with Greg, uh, with George Marino. And then I remember walking in there, hating the record and walking out, absolutely loving it because I was hearing it as a record for the first time, you know, and like George did his little thing I and mean, he didn't do a whole hell of a lot to those. I was watching him EQ and compress the mixes and stuff like that, but he wasn't doing anything drastic, you know, but that little bit he did took it over the, over the finish line and, and polished it up. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm hearing a record, you know? So like distance and, you know, not getting married is, is really important, you know, like uh, it's almost like speed mixing. You know what I mean, just like get there, get to a point where you can listen to the mix and everything is in and then put it away then come back and dial in the details later, you know, because otherwise it just gets really overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes like, sometimes there, there's an advantage to just doing things quickly too, because then you can send it off to the band and get their opinions on, you know, what it sounds like in a song. So you're not spending like, two days working on a mix and then the band's like oh you missed you missed the mark on this one you know yeah exactly you know and there's no, no matter what you do the band's not is always going to have come back with changes no i very rarely have i delivered a mix and the band's like perfect don't change anything you know there's always like you know a handful of little things like oh you know can we back off on the reverb on that and you know the vocal needs to be a little brighter and the background vocals need to come down a bit you know there's always little micro changes you know 
So when I send off version one of a mix, in my mind, even to myself, I'm like, that's 85% done. You know, like I'm, there are a lot of things I want to change on that mix, but let me see if the direction is right, you know, with the band. And then I'll dial in the rest of it, you know, when I get their revisions, you know. And also, an important thing to, to do when sending mixes out is I always ask the band, is like, all right, tell me what you want to change. Tell me what you don't like. But more importantly, tell me what you like. Because, like, in the process of making these changes, I don't want to undo the things that you like. And the second thing is I have a fragile ego. I need to be that needs to be stroked constantly. So please tell me what you like. <laughs> you know. Of course. Well, no, it, it's good to have those references because then you know what to, to mix with. Or like what what sound they're gonna be comparing it to, right? Yeah, exactly. And but but just tell me when I send you the mix, tell me what you really like about the mix, you know. So like the drum will come back and say, dude, the way that snare is like punching, I love it, you know. And if you have a, a, a note from the singer saying, Yeah, but the vocal isn't loud enough, you know, if the snare is really loud in the mix and the drummer's liking it and the vocalist thinks he can't hear the vocal, instead of turning down the snare to hear the vocal better, I'm gonna turn up the vocal. You know, what I mean things like that, you know, you, you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're going to change to accommodate what they want isn't going to compromise the things that they like. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, always, tell, I always tell the band, there's no such thing as too many notes. You know what I mean? There's like, there's, you know, tell me everything. You, you, I don't care. If you want to write me you know, uh, a, a 12 page you know, credo, credo about this one mix, fine. I don't care. You know, but like, there's no such thing as uh, not enough information. Absolutely. Well, one, one other question that I wanted to ask you about mixing is, uh, to do with low end and like you've obviously worked on some massive hip hop records and you've also worked on some massive rock records and in both genres it's critical to get that low end feeling right you know making it feel massive getting your kick and bass to like really punch and all that um, but each genre also has its own kind of um, tilt so to speak of, of how much low end you should have right so I'm just curious so I'm just curious to know like do you have any tips for balancing low end and and getting that consistent sound between your records um geez um for me uh, for getting my low end together is all about like knowing my speakers really well you know um and what the, what the bottom end response is uh, like on them you know uh, for me like frequencies in general is i i always look um at a mix sonically and divide it into four you know frequency spectrums you got your low end you got your low mid you got your high mid and you got your highs and like I was saying before about um, making sure that you're in a monitoring environment that's as accurate as possible. If I'm working in a room that isn't, then when I'm mixing, I am very conscious about what's going on in each of those four areas, you know, the highs, the high mids, the low mids, and the lows. And for me, as long as everything is balanced inside those four areas, I'll be in a good spot. And the, the, the inconsistencies, the frequency response in the room I'm in can be ironed out in mastering. You know what I mean? So like if, uh, if the room is really bright, but while I'm mixing, I think all the top end is holding up really well together between all the different instruments. And I take that mix out and because the mix is really bright, when I go back to my house, everything sounds really dull. I know that if I run this through an EQ and I crank up the top end, it's going to be balanced because I was very conscious about what's going on in all these areas. And so same thing with the mix. You have to make a bunch of decisions ahead of time as to what's going to be driving the low end. You know, like you have to make a decision. Like, is this going to be a kick drum driven song? Is this going to be a bass driven song? All right. Well, if it's a bass driven song, how is the bass driving this mix? Is it driving it because, uh, is it driving it melodically because it's got a really cool bass line? Or is this one of those rock songs where the guy's just pedaling, you know, eighth notes on the one? In which case, it's kind of, now you've got a combo kind of a thing going on. The bass and the kick are probably going to be driving the song, you know. So you have to again make the decision like what's going to dominate that sub frequency. Is it going to be the kick or is it going to be the bass? You know, and the genre and the style of music is going to dictate that. You know, and of course, you know, there's always meet at one guy. Who says, well, it's got to be both. You know, it's got, you know they both have to drive the thing. You know, and, but in that pl in that case, you kind of have to make you know. You got to analyze what is it trying to do. Well, if the bass and the kick have to be loud, when, why? Is it because the bass has a melody and it's got a line and it, you have to hear it and the kick drum has to like, you know, go with the beat? Well, then, then at that point, you have to say, okay, well, if the kick is going to be driving rhythmically and the bass has got to be driving melodically, well, then maybe I should make the kick drum a little on the clicky side. 
you know, give it an a, a, a upper mid range click so that you can definitely feel this pulse as the mix goes on. And then maybe I can duck, I can roll off a little bit of the bottom end and then let the bottom end of the bass fill up that spot because you got to hear every note that's going on. Or maybe you, you want the kick to be hitting you in the chest and you want to hear the melody of the bass. Well, in that case, maybe you want to roll down the ultra lows in the bass and then make up for the melodic aspect by, you know, pushing up, let's say around 700, that, like that, that lowish, that mid, mid, mid range frequency. And so you can, so people can hear the note, you know, and it's a struggle. It's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not like, got, like, like every engineer has got like the secret thing that they you know dial in to say okay yeah that's how I get is it my separation between the bass and the kick and the bass. You have to basically roll through every trick in the book, you know, like oh that's not working, like, EQing isn't working here, so maybe I need to duck duck the bass with the kick drum, you know. Again, those MIDI notes I generated before is, are going to come in handy. I can use that MIDI ducker to duck the bass every time the kick drum hits, and only in that one band, you know, that little frequency because I have a multi band gate going on or multi band ducker. You know, uh, it's it's a lot of trial and error, and listening on different speakers, and listening on headphones, and you know, and just trying to make a decision about where the focus is. You know, like for, for and for me, that's everything that is a mix is about. Is that your job as a mixer is to focus the listener's attention to the spots that you want the artist that the artist wants the the, the listener to be focused on. You know, um, like if if you were singing this song to somebody, how would you be singing this song to somebody? Like, um, if you were like, take a song like smells like teen spirit and you're singing it to somebody, you'd be going, so all those things I'm singing are all the parts that Andy Wallace emphasized in the mix, you know, while he was doing it. So the whole idea is you need to guide that listener through the entire song and putting a spotlight on the things that he should be paying attention to, you know, like in this part of the song, is it really important that the tambourine is heard? Not really, you know, but in the chorus it is, you know, so let's pull it out and just duck it down in the verse and bring it up in the choruses, you know, do is, is the baseline the most important thing in the verse? Maybe not, but maybe it's really important in the choruses. So you have to like sort of, I call it like stepping stones. You got you got these stepping stones in this stream, and you want to make sure that the listener is on the right one all the way across. You know, like emotionally, where do you want them to be? What do you want them to be paying attention to? And so, like every moment in the mix, that decision has to be made. Like you know, you pull the vocal out, or obviously you're going to be paying attention to the vocal, but like besides the vocal, what is it in this in this spot of the song? What in this four bars or in this chorus or in this section of the song, what is the thing that's driving it? What is the most important thing that they should be listening to? Because the listener can only pay attention at most to three or four things besides the vocal. So that's what you gotta do. You gotta put the spotlight on it. And so it's the same thing with controlling your bottom end. You know, like where do you want, like what is it that you want to, like when somebody's talking about the bottom end, that, you know, like a listener who knows nothing about mixing and when they're, they're humming about the bottom end, are they going, doom, 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 or are they going doom, doom, do, 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 like what is it that they're going to be doing, you know? And if you put the spotlight in the wrong spot, the mix will fall apart, you know? I think that is my new favorite trick, singing the parts. Singing the part, like what is it? Yeah, exactly. Like what? Sing the song, and what is it that you want to sing? Like when the person's not singing, and there's an instrumental section, what do you want the the listener to be describing to his friend about the song, you know, like, you know, Oh yeah. Then after he sang this, there was this part, you know, in, in the breakdown, there was this, you know? Yeah. That, that's an incredible, incredible tip because yeah, I think, I think everyone just thinks, Oh, everything has to be like, you know, everything's the focus here. We just got to make everything clear. And it's like, no, you can't, you have to have a focus. Like there, there's always yeah, that there, one element. There has to be a, yeah, there has to be a focus point. There has to be a stepping stone. There has to be something, and 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 you as a mixer in the band and a producer, like all every part of the production is all about that. You know, it's like you know when you're writing, you know when you're writing, or when you're arranging, when you're layering guitar. Like, am I layering layering this guitar because I feel I have to, or is it actually performing? Is it have a purpose? You know, is am I just doing it because it's something that people do? You know. Like I just finished mixing this record for an old buddy of mine, a guy who's be, I was roommates with for years, and he had this one song where it was just everything played all the time. 
you know, and he walked over and he gave it to me. So I have no idea what to do with this, you know, do something. And I just spent like, you know, three hours just you know, muting things, you know, and trying to figure out where to focus, you know, like, what's the cool part, you know, like, oh yeah, this keyboard's playing through the entire thing, but it's really doing something cool in, in the verses. So I'm not going to use it anywhere else except the verses, you know, or like this rhythm guitar part is really not performed. I'm going to mute that and, you know, or, you know, or that's a little cool little moment there, you know, so it's, it's going through everything and, and figuring out where all the highlights are. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm kind of glad I don't have an assistant who preps everything for me because by prep, having to go through all the multi-tracks, every track in a session, uh, being able to hear, listen to every track on its own and, and trying to figure out what it is that's doing. By the time I finish my uh, session prep, I've, I know that it multi-track inside and out and I know what all the parts are doing and I know what everything's purpose is for. Whereas if, if I had an assistant who just basically said, okay, here, everything's prepped, start mixing, you know, I'd, I'd have to go through that process anyway, listening through everything. So, you know, it's a give and take, you know, but like everything should have a purpose. You know, if, if something's being, if something is there and it's not adding anything and it's not, you know, taking, and if taking it away doesn't make the song any less, then get rid of it. You know, that's always been my thing. Like I get these, <laughs> sometimes I get these tracks from bands who record themselves and they'll put four microphones on an amp and then I get a Pro Tool session and for every guitar part, there's four tracks, you know, and I'm like, why didn't you make a decision? <laughs> you know, uh, commit, commit as often as possible. You know, yeah, you might paint yourself into a corner, but that's, that's part of the, that's part of the whole process, you know, like, okay, well, I, I, I bounced these mics together when I recorded it. It didn't kind of, you know, come out the way I wanted it to, but what can I do with it to make it, you know, a thing, you know, maybe that really crappy sound is the thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I I love everything you're saying here, man. Like these are amazing tips that I, I think people are going to find a lot of value out of, and uh, that's probably a good spot to to start to wrap things up. Um, so so yeah, if, Chris, thank you so so much for taking the time to to do this. Uh, no problem. If, if people want to learn more about you or follow you online, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, I've got a website. It's a uh, chrisshawmix.com. I try to keep it up to date. It's a little behind now. It's about six months out out of date right now and then on facebook it's chris shaw mix is you know my facebook you know my my public facebook thing and the same thing on twitter as well it's you know chris shaw mix across the board lastly are there any cool projects that you're currently working on that uh you could talk about um that i can talk about no okay, okay fair that's fair <laughs> they're all big projects always, yeah, yeah there's always something i'm working on that i can't talk about and that's what i'm working on right now unfortunately <laughs> so. okay <laughs> We'll know soon enough. Check out my discography. You know, you can go to allmusic.com. You know, all, 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 my, st all my stuff's there. You know, and uh, yeah. Amazing. Well, Chris, thank, thank you again for, for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. It was, it was a pleasure, man. Well, that was my interview with Chris Shaw, and there were so many good nuggets inside of that episode. I love what he was sharing about his gating trick and how he uses MIDI to control his gates and how he can also use it for compression and all that kind of stuff as well. I just thought it was such a smart way of doing things. I also really love how he talked about um, flipping the phase when you're multi-miking guitars too. I thought that was a really cool technique for finding the frequencies that you want to get rid of in your tones and being able to capture them properly by just moving around your mics here and there until you get that right sound. So I just thought those were two great tips right away. And uh, that tip that he shared at the very end as well about singing the song and being able to use that as a way of identifying how to prioritize the volume of instruments in your mixes, man, that is such a great idea. And, uh, I just think that example that he gave with, with Smells Like Teen Spirit, it's so true. It's like you can just sing along to those songs and you instantly know those memorable parts. And those are the parts that you should be boosting in your mixes. So for you, the listener, I hope that you enjoyed this episode just as much as I did. There was, again, so many great takeaways from this, and it was just so much fun to have Chris on the show. Now, if you did enjoy this episode, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a rating and review on the Apple Podcast app if you can. That's just a great way for us to be able to spread the word about the podcast and help out more musicians with creating amazing sounding recordings from their home studios. And speaking of that, if you haven't already, make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is where I help out tons of musicians with creating pro sounding recordings 
recordings from their home studios, feeling proud of the music that they're putting out. And that's where I have a bunch of great resources designed to help you out so that we can make the process of mixing easy for you. Now, while you're there, make sure to check out the Mixing Mindset book. This is a book that I put out a few years ago. It became an Amazon number one bestseller. And inside of this book, we really break down the process of mixing so that you know what order you should work in, what frequencies to be boosting, which ones to be cutting, when to use automation, when to use effects, all of that kind of stuff. The idea is just to really simplify the process of mixing so that you don't feel scattered throughout your process. Instead, you can make better sounding mixes in way less time. So once again, that is called the Mixing Mindset book, and you can find that at MasterYourMix.com. So that is the end of this episode, guys. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end, and I'm really looking forward to chatting with you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.